morning. It's going to be Mark chapter 4. I got to be honest with you, I don't think that this is like any kind of Christmas message I've ever preached before. The Lord had definitely put a, a, a specific Christ, Christmas passage on my heart, and we will get to that. But then I really felt like He wanted me to, to preach on this particular uh, passage of Scripture, Mark chapter 4, verse 35, all the way through chapter 5, verse 20. And uh, I didn't really, I kind of like, I don't know, I wouldn't say I wrestled with it. I mean, I felt like it was definitely the Lord, but it was just a little bit different. But uh, I, do feel, I do believe that the Lord pulled it all together. So here we go. We're going to just read this story out of Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through chapter 5, verse 20. It says, In the same day, when the evening was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over to the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind. So they were going across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And there's a little fleet of ships with them. And all of a sudden, this storm shows up. And the waves... They beat into the ship so that it was now full, and he was in the hinder part or the back part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awakened him, and he said, and they said unto him, Master, do you care not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there near unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith, Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There was about 2,000. And they were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. And when he was coming to the ship, he had he had he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee and has compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. I, 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 I titled my message this morning, Good Tidings. And the reason that I titled it that is because of what the word means. The word tidings literally means 
news or information. And I got to tell you that in this story, there's some really good news and some good information. It's kind of like a heavy story. But, you know, just real quick, because I know we're in the King James Version here so that everybody's on the same page and we understand what's going on. Jesus really before this is teaching his disciples some various things about the gospel, about the Bible. He's teaching them the truth of what God's word is all about. And then immediately after that, really on the same day in the afternoon, the Bible says that they got into the ship to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And there were a few other ships that were with them. And there was a great storm. I know that you caught most of that, but I just want to make sure we're on the same page. A great storm that arose and Jesus rebuked the wind. He told the wind, he told the waves to peace be still. And all of a sudden the storm, you know, dissipated and, and it went away. And what the disciples came to the realization and the revelation is that he even has power over the weather. Yes. But then we see the situation where there's a storm in a person's life. Hallelujah. He, he went through a storm in order to get to this person. Nothing was going to stop him. It kind of reminds me of the Samaritan woman whenever the Bible says that Jesus must needs go through Samaria. It means that the Holy Spirit was driving Jesus to go out of the way. We're not going to get into all of that right now, but went out of the way all for the purpose of coming to a particular woman so that he could minister to her life. And in a similar situation, Jesus went through this storm. Nothing was going to stop him in order to get to this one person that needed him to, to, to touch him in his life. Praise Amen. The Bible talks about the fact that, that you know, when it was all said and done, it, that he had so many devils on the inside of him. It says he saw Jesus afar off and he ran over there and he bowed down and, he, and it's not the man talking. I mean, there's a, obviously an aspect to this man that wants to bow down to Jesus, but it's the devils that are talking to Jesus. Amen. The demons that say that, so who, who are you? Why have you come to torment us before the appointed time? Jesus told the unclean spirits to come out of him and said, what is your name? He said, we are legion. For, my name is legion for we are many. A legion was over 2,000 Roman soldiers at that time. So the idea is that there could have been up to 2,000 demon spirits on the inside of this man. When it's all said and done, though, what we see is that this man, he's clothed now. And he's sitting in his right mind. And, and, and the Bible says that what he wants to do is he wants to go with Jesus. That's what it was saying. And he said, it says, I, I pray thee that you, that you let me come with you. And then the King James Version says, but Jesus suffered him not. In other words, Jesus said, no, you, you're not, you, you're not going to come with us. But instead, what I need you to do is I need you to go and tell your friends and your family. You know, one of the things I, I, I pointed out was that before they went in the sea, Jesus was teaching to the disciples uh, about, about the word of God. He explained how God's word, some of what he was talking about was that God's word was like a seed that grows. It, it, many of you may not realize this, or most of you probably do realize this, but maybe there's a couple of people that don't know. God's word is like a seed. In other words, whenever you speak forth the truth of God's word, you know, a seed that goes into the ground and it begins to it begins to cause roots to come out and the roots begin to, to grow down into the soil. And then it takes time for the for the seedling to show up on the on the, uh, you know, up in the air where you can see it on the other side of the dirt. And many times in people's lives, you get exposed to the Bible. You get exposed to the Word of God. Sometimes it's the first time that you've ever been exposed to the Bible like a seed that was thrown in the soil. I can remember one of the first times that I ever heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, don't get me wrong. I was born in, I was born in a family that believed in church. But it was religion. And, and we just went through the motions of going to church and I wasn't really ever learning anything about the Bible. But I can remember the first time my sister came home after her life was different and she talked about Jesus. I don't know what your story is, how you were first exposed to the gospel. Maybe it was a friend of yours and their family believed differently than the way that you believe. But at some point in time, you were exposed to the word. Maybe today is the first time that the seed of the gospel is being thrown into your heart like a seed that's being placed in the soil. But what happens is, is that with time it begins to grow, right? But let me tell you something, that, that whenever you get taught the word of God, you can expect that there's going to be a test in your life. 
Just like whenever you're in school and you're over there learning information and the teacher's giving you all this information and you're taking notes and you go home and you say, why are you studying? Because there's a test. There's going to be a test that's going to come. Jesus is over here teaching his disciples about the word of God like it's a seed. Amen. But, he, but in the parable of, soil, of the, so, the sower, he also talks about the fact that there can be trials and tribulations, negative circumstances that test the seed That's in, that, and when he's talking about the kingdom of God. And immediately they get into a ship and they face a trial of their own. They face a storm. But not only that, they face this storm that's in this man's life and they see the gospel at work. They they see the word of God at work, both in the physical and also in the spiritual. And I need you to know that the trials of life that we experience and, and it's Satan's plan to try to destroy the word of God in our lives. Do, do, do you understand that there's a real devil? <laughs> Whether or not you really believe it, 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 it that, that doesn't make it true or false. I'm here to tell you what God's word says. There's a real devil that wants to destroy people's lives. And he wants to destroy the seed of God's word in people's lives. He doesn't want the seed of God's word to be planted in your heart and for it to grow and to produce a harvest in your life. No, he wants you to fall asleep. He wants you to think it's all a joke. He wants you to think that, that it's all just this play thing. And that one day you wake up and you, know, and you wake up to eternity and you find out that you ignored God's word. You ignored the ways of God. And that the enemy stole from you, he stole from you, he killed things in your life, and he destroyed you ultimately. The devil's playing for real. Amen. The devil's playing for keeps. That's right. And God allows these things to take place. God allows the trials of life to take place. God allows the storms of life to take place. Because it's a testing of the faith to see where you really are. In the kingdom of God, whether or not you're really going to receive the truth of God's word, whether or not you're going to allow that seed to be cultivated in the soil of your heart or whether or not it's just going to be extinguished in your life. A test of the faith. And like I was saying earlier, you can expect that each time you hear the word of God, there will be a test that comes. And tests come in a variety of ways. But there are always situations that will show up in our lives opportunities to trust God, opportunities to obey God, opportunities to disobey, trials, tests. This passage of scripture is just like that. There was a teaching of God's word and there was a test that followed. Two main thoughts that I thought of, that stuck out to me. There was a literal storm that caused fear and danger in the lives of the disciples. And it was a situation that they didn't have control over. A lot of times when we're faced with things that we don't have control over, we don't really know how in the world we're going to fix it. Sometimes you can't fix it. That's right. And not only that, there was also a storm raging in a person's life, a personal storm that he had no control over. He couldn't control it. But hallelujah in both occurrences. What is hallelujah? It means praise be to God in both occurrences. Jesus had power over both of those storms. When he spoke... The storms listened and obeyed. And people may not realize it, and, but the Bible teaches that because of the sin of Adam, you might not have known this. Well, go ahead and put this scripture up here. It's kind of a long passage of scripture, but we're going to read it. Because of the sin of Adam, the whole world faces a storm. Romans lips. Romans 8, 18 through 23. We're talking about the fact that Adam's sin has caused a whole mess to the world right now. Because I'm kind of explaining this physical storm that they experience, right? The Apostle Paul says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What he's basically saying right there is, is that many times we experience negative circumstances on earth, but it should not be compared to the glory that one day we're going to be exposed to. It says, for, for the earnest expectation of the creature, that's talking about you and me, or the creation really. It's talking about the creation, all creation. It waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. What it's talking about is, is that all creation is waiting for Jesus to bring to finality what he's going to do in mankind. 
Does that make sense? Do you, do you understand that the Bible teaches that one day you and I are going to see God and whenever that happens, we're going to receive a glorified body that this body that's now decaying and dying is going to be clothed with the glory of God and things are going to be completely different than everything that we've ever experienced before. The Bible says there will be no more tears, there will be no more sorrow, there will be no more crying. Hallelujah. It goes on to say this, but the creature, the creator, Creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation, everything, trees, birds, everything that you see, it says that it groans and it travails. Why? It, the all of creation, the grass withers, the flower dies, the bird dies and decays on the ground, the tree decays and the limbs fall in the swamp, even though you don't hear it, something just splashed because everything's dying around us. Because of the fault, whether you believe, you, you may believe what they teach you in school about evolution. You might want to believe whatever the science people say. But I'm here to tell you that God says something different. That's right. Hallelujah. It's the fall of mankind because of the sin of Adam that has thrown everything into disarray. And essentially what it goes on to say is this, is that, that, that God is going to change all of that. That all creation is groaning. And I'm just, I said all that just to explain to you the truth that, that we live on a fallen earth. That's the main thing that I'm trying, that I'm trying to, to, to explain to you. That the pain that you experience, whatever the things are that have happened in your life. I mean, you can make it personal for yourself. I mean, you know the pain of your own life better than I know the pain of your life. I know the things that I experienced as a teenager. You know, whether it was the, 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 the demands that I felt like my dad had placed on me or whether or not it was, the, the, you know, the fact that he drank more than. I mean, you know, look, whatever. I'm not trying to be a crybaby here. I've told you all the story a whole bunch of times, but my dad drank too much and he was too mean. OK, and yeah, it toughened me up, but he could have just as much gone the other way. It's not, it wasn't good because I was a sick puppy by the time I got finally got saved. And it took a whole lot of time for God to really work out. I'm still kind of messed up a little bit with some of that. <laughs> I still catch myself sometimes thinking, man, you kind of like a little sissy. You know, this is what I think in my mind whenever people start complaining too much. And that's not really the Lord. We're supposed to have compassion for people. Amen. Jesus had compassion on people and it kind of it messed me up my, my dad's way of thinking you know what I'm saying and that's just one example but but not only that all of the pain of the things that he's repeating you know it's just not really good I'm just using myself as an example because I'm trying to make you think about your own story don't focus on my story because you all got your own pain that you've experienced you've all experienced your own level of pain ain't nobody in here that hasn't experienced pain I'm just using my story to try to make the point that we've all experienced it, right? And, and from that, we try various things to remedy our situation. Things that the world has to offer that only cause more destruction, more pain, more heartache, and begin to affect the other people around us. That's right. Get the point that I'm trying to make? All right, so we don't have to get into the details of the story again. But you know what? What I wanted to talk to you about, too, was about the tornadoes and the hurricanes that are in our life and, and about this man and the fact that he's being tormented. And what about the things that we have experienced or continue to experience in our lives and how are we going to get free from them? Whatever it is that we we're going through, how are we going to get free? How will we find peace in the midst of the storm. How will the people that we know find peace in the midst of the storm? You might have just showed up here on accident today and you might have you might be in the middle of a storm yourself. But you might be also saying, man, but I also know some people in the storm. You understand what I'm saying? You might think, well, you know what? I don't have it all that bad. But and maybe you don't. Maybe for the most part, some people's lives are, pr are pretty stable. You know what I'm saying? That, but that, doesn't, that ain't going to get them into glory. That's right. <laughs> Just because your life's stable doesn't mean that you're okay and that you're going to make it into heaven. No, you're either going to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior according to what the Bible says or else you will not enter the kingdom of God. That's right. But what I want to say is this, is that maybe you know somebody that's in pain. There, there's an element to this story today that also speaks to that. I want to consider just a couple of things about this man real quick. 
and his situation. This is point number one. And I posed it as a question. You ready for this? Where have you made your bed? That's point number one. Where have you made your bed? Look at, uh, well, we can't look at Mark 5, 3. But as I talked to you about Mark 5, 3, you'll remember when I read the story. It said, who had his dwelling amongst the tombs. You remember when we said that? You know what that idea in the Greek is right there? In the original language that the Bible was written in, had his dwelling amongst the tombs. The idea is he settled down there. It's kind of like whenever we talk about, oh, I settled down in South Louisiana, you know. I, I had traveled all over, and finally when I settled down, it was in South Louisiana, or we got some visitors here. I, I settled down in the valley of, Te in, the, in the southern valley of Texas, or wherever it was. I settled down. I was, I was doing my thing, but then finally I settled down. Well, this man settled amongst the tombs. This is where he chose to live his life. That's why I asked the question, where will you make your bed? Now, one of the things that I want you to understand is this, is that according to the Bible, according to the Jewish people, the tombs were considered unclean. Remember, I don't know if you remember or not, if you've read your Bible, but Jesus rebuked some religious people one time. He said to the religious people, you're like a bunch of whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. What did he mean by that? He, he, he says, you clean the outside of the cup, but the inside is full of filth. See, they would paint those tombs real nice and pretty, and they looked all white and clean on the outside. But Jesus was saying on the inside was dead men's bones. And according to the Bible, dead things were considered unclean in a spiritual sense. For you and I today, what does that mean? Sin causes death, and death is unclean. Amen. And what I want you to know is, is that the tombs and also the pigs were considered unclean by the people of God. God had said so. God has a people, I need you to understand this, that belong to him. On this earth, God has a people that belong. Whether or not you to this morning are God's people or not, you might think you are, but sometimes people might be surprised to find out that maybe they thought they were God's people. Let me just, just take a back, back up a second. What does it require to be God's people? You know, if you polled Americans today, do you know that 85% of Americans, according to a Gallup poll, would say that they're Christians? Yep. And you know why they would say that? Because my mom and daddy said that we were Christians. That's not what it means to be a Christian. Just because you believe that there was a man named Jesus that lived on the earth in your brain. And just because you believe that that man Jesus may have died on the cross. Even you may believe it for the sins. That doesn't mean that you've believed. See the Bible teaches that there's a belief from the heart. Hallelujah. Not from the head. And when you believe from the heart. Let me tell you, see how this man came a running and he bowed down? When you believe from the heart and you bow down your life to the Lord Jesus and you invite him into your heart and you say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Lord, come into my heart. Lord, I believe that you died on the cross, but I want to give you my life. See, Jesus gave his life for you and he's asking for you to give your life back to him. And when you do that, I'm just here to explain it to you. A miracle happens in the spiritual realm. Amen. A miracle happens that transforms the inside of Amen. who you are. Yes. It's not just a thought in the head anymore, but it's something that happens in the heart. If you've never experienced what I've told you before, <laughs> then the truth of the matter is, is that you're probably not, according to what the Bible says, born again. The Bible says man must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. In order to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. I didn't say that. I didn't write that. Jesus said it to a religious man. So there's a whole lot of religious people on the earth that think that they're okay. But the reality of it is, is that they've never truly been born again. Good news. He's only one call away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's only one call away. All you got to do is take a knee. Amen. And bow your heart to Jesus and he will change you. But I, I said all that to say this. God has a people on the earth. The people of God are those that have truly been born again. Oh, what you're talking about, preacher? You got to be perfect. No, as a matter of fact, a lot of times you're going to see that people that say that they really love God are far from perfect. 
Amen. If you hang around the church long enough, you're going to realize that they got a whole lot of jacked up people in the church. A whole lot of people with wrong attitudes, a whole lot of people with big mouths that don't know how to shut their mouth, don't have a filter from their brain to their mouth, and say whatever it is that they want to say to hurt other people's feelings and do whatever they want to do to live their own life. And at the same time, like the word of faith people would say, but I'm the righteousness of God. Well, you know what? Jesus' righteousness don't look nothing like that. Jesus was humble and he was loving and he was kind and he was gentle and he was compassionate and he cared about other people. The people he rebuked was the religious folk. That's right. Amen. Oh, I'm just trying to say that God has a people. Where are you going to make your bed? Are you going to live in the tombs? Are you going to live amongst the unclean? Are you going to make choices to live your life amongst the unclean? Because God's got a people and he didn't call his people to live in the tombs. He didn't call his people to live amongst the unclean. God called his people out from the darkness. There's, I got scriptures here. Luke chapter 1 verse 79. It says to give light to them that sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. We read this last night for like the little Christmas thing. This is the Luke God narrative. This is Zacharias, John the Baptist's daddy who could not speak. And then all of a sudden the Lord opened up his mouth and he prophesied this long passage of scripture. And he was talking about his own son, John the Baptist, that would preach the gospel and prepare the way for Jesus to come. And he said that the one that was going to come was going to bring light in the midst of darkness and was going to show us the way towards peace. Hallelujah. God's bringing peace on this earth. In Colossians 1.13, he says, who has delivered us? Who's who? Jesus. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, you may already know this, but let me explain to you a little bit more about this whole born again thing. The first time you were born of your mother... I'm talking about when you were, what, what hospital were you born in? Believe it, I was born at, at Lakewood. Old, I never, never really lived around here that much, but I was born here. I was born in that little hospital. And the first time I was born of my mother, in the physical, I was born, according to the first birth, the Bible says I was born of Adam. That means I was born in sin. That means every last one, I'm not picking on you, mama. We all in the same boat. It's not your fault. We were just all born of Adam. And we were all born in sin. Every last one of us. When we came out of our mother's womb, we were born in sin. The Bible teaches that. Listen, you, you, look, at, you look at two little babies. I, I like the way this one preacher used to say this. Brother Larson used to say, you don't have to teach a child sin. Why, why am I even backing up to describe all of this? Let me tell you why I'm backing up. Because most people in their mind look at a little baby and its soft little skin and its cute little voice. And it's pretty little eyes. And they say, oh, shy, look how cute. And they just want to kiss all over the juicy little lips. And they're just so innocent and sweet and precious. And I love me a baby. But let me tell you something. The Bible says that that baby was already born in sin. And if you think that I'm lying, let me tell you this. You just wait till about nine months old, 12 months old. And you put two of them in the same crib and give them one toy. Give them one toy and then back up. And you watch the show. And you see what's going to happen. And let me tell you, them two babies, they'll like nearly tear themselves apart all to get that one little toy because selfishness and sin is bound up in the heart of the child because we were already born that way. You don't have to teach a child to do wrong. It's already on the inside of them. The first time you were born of your mother, you were born of Adam and you were born in sin. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. And the Bible says in Colossians 1 that he delivered us from the power of darkness and he translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And what I'm here to tell you, whether you've experienced it or not, when you were born of Adam in sin and you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you will believe from your heart and believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, a miracle happens where the old man born of Adam dies with Jesus and a new man is born again and resurrect to a new life. Hallelujah. And it gets a new heart. Listen, where are you going to make your bed though? 
Because God hasn't called his people that belong to him on the earth to live in the tombs. Amen. He hasn't called his people to live in unclean places. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You, church, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Can I tell you something, Christian? Especially you young Christians, if you can give me your ear just for a little second. You don't have to pay attention much longer after this. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> just give me like three seconds. Well, 25 seconds. Whenever you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live in, the, in your heart, you are different than you used to be. Amen. Amen. You may spend the majority of your teenage years trying to hide it. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Why? Because you're a peculiar person. It means you're different. Uh-oh, here we go. Come on, the Lord likes that word. You're a peculiar person and you're different than the world around you. It's a different spirit. The spirit of the devil is prevalent in the world. The spirit of the devil causes people to do things that, the, that, that looks different than the things of God. But when you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart, he makes you different than the world around you. You ain't supposed to just keep on doing everything that the world is doing. Man, I can remember when my sister first got saved. Look, I, was, I told y'all before I was a mess, man. My sister first got saved when I was 13. And I used to go to church with her when I was 13. And I went up to the altar. I hear old sister took preaching, man. And I'd go up to the altar. And I, God, I guarantee I must have got saved 10 times before I really got saved. But, but the whole time I'd go back and I was just like this man of gathering. That's why I'm preaching on him today. That's what my life was like. I wasn't possessed by the devil, thank God. But my life just soon looked like that because nobody could take me. No, nothing that they could do would bind me. Nothing that they would try to do could help me. And I was just completely out of control. And I, and I can remember with my old long hair at this party, man, doing the things that I was always doing, living my life, thinking I was so cool. And then all of a sudden, I can remember somebody talking bad about Jesus. And I can remember literally ready to get in a fight with this person. Uh -huh. yeah. You talk about Jesus like that. But at the same time, I also remember one time after I got out of rehab, I was riding on this bicycle with my friend. And man, when I was in that rehab, some Baptists came. I think I've told you all this story before. Some Baptists came with a Bible and they told me about Jesus. And I can remember praying in that place and thinking, Lord, I know so many times you've talked to me. So many times you've showed up when I needed you to show up. And Lord, I feel all this guilt and I want you to forgive me, Lord. And I want to live for you. And I, and I meant it when I prayed it. And then when I got out, I was riding my bicycle with that friend of mine and I said dude have you ever thought about Jesus and he made some kind of comment that like j just cut it down and it made me feel so weird that I just shut my mouth like a little dog put my tail between my legs and didn't say another word for God knows how long until the Lord finally got a hold of me whenever you truly get saved there's something different about you than there is about the world and you may try to hide it but if you're saved I'm here to tell you you're a peculiar person you're a whole you're a royal priesthood you're a holy nation he's called look at little bit it goes on hallelujah thank you Jesus he says that you should show forth the praises of him you might try to stifle it you might try to hide it you might try to suppress it but that's not your purpose on this earth your purpose on this earth is to show forth the praises of God he is called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Hallelujah. God's got a people that belong to him. But once again, the question that I ask is, where are you going to make your bed? God has not called his people to live amongst the tombs. He has not God called his people to live in unclean places. God sent Jesus into the world to bring us out of darkness and into light. But if we settle down in an unclean place of darkness, then we are inviting storms into our lives. Help us, Lord. That was point number one. Where are you going to make your bed? Point number two, no one else and nothing else is going to fix the problem. Did you hear what I said? No one else and nothing else is going to fix the problem. In verses three and four of Mark chapter five, it says, no man could bind him. No, not with chains, because that he had often been bound with fetters. That's talking about ankle chains. And chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. I get this picture, I mean, this probably won't mean much to y'all, 
because like y'all never seen Aaron, my, my brother-in-law Aaron, he's kind of he's kind of a trip. Sometimes he acts real funny, like I, he acts real crazy. And he used, to, he used to do this thing where like you would act like you were frustrated. I don't know if you remember. He'd be like, hey, hey, like and he and he would act like you know like, but he was but he was joking around, almost like he was just frustrated. And that's kind of what I see in this person. I see in this person that he's frustrated and he's trying to break free. And he's trying, he, he's sick and tired of being sick and tired. And, 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 but he can't, he can't fix it. And, and nothing that anyone is trying, they're all trying to help him. Yeah, yeah, you see what I'm saying? Like society is trying to help him. The, 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 really the citizenry around in the neighborhood is not really cool with the way he's acting. He's howling in the, in the middle of the night. He's, he's cutting himself. He's screeching. He, he, he's running around naked. And granted, I realize that most of us ain't running, around, <laughs> ain't, ain't running around naked acting like a fool like this. But at the same time, I want you to get the principle of what I'm trying to say. Because he reminds me of me whenever, before the Lord really set me free. Just frustrated. Trying to break free. The same thing, trying to hold me down. Maybe some of you have felt that way before. Maybe not to this extreme, but feel as though that something just keeps binding you and holding you and, you and you're not able to get free. No matter what people around you try to do to help you, it's not really working. Nothing that they could do could really stop because this was a spiritual issue. This was a spiritual problem. They were trying to fix it with physical issues. They were trying to tame him and bind him and hold him. But, but physical things aren't going to fix a spiritual problem. Amen. And I'm here to tell you that no one else and nothing else is going to fix that issue. Yo, you can try. I, what I hear, oh, I, need to, I need you to understand something. A new boyfriend or a girlfriend is not going to fix the issue. Amen. It's not going to do it. You can keep trying. New bar, new shoes, nothing. That's right. I got it in here. No, a new car. That was that wasn't the next thing. New car, <laughs> new shoes, a new house, a new job, pay raise. The psychiatrist can't do it. A pill's not going to fix it. Another drink's not going to do it. I'm sorry. The medication is not going to ultimately quiet the storm on the inside That's of your right. life. Oh, we might put a band-aid on it. It might make you think that it's okay, but the reality of it is, is that no, you need an internal healing from the Lord to do a spiritual work on the inside of you. No one else, nothing else is going to be able to touch that or fix that spot other than the Lord himself. That's right. Not even a new little baby. <laughs> and I got Bella right here in parentheses. Because I still remember the day whenever I wasn't doing good with the Lord. I was going to church. I was going through the motions. And little Isabella was born. And I can remember like holding her in the hospital thinking, man, look at this. I got to really do better. And boy, I tell you, I meant it. I meant it so much. I got to really do better. But you know what? That wore off. Even the pressure, I mean, I'm not saying that a kid and the responsibility of being a father doesn't change it because it has. It has definitely changed. I used to hate to work. Now you can't really get me out of that place. It definitely changed. But what I'm trying to get at is this, is that nothing physical is going to fix the issue. The only thing that can calm the storm is when Jesus tells it, peace be still. That's right. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Cast all your care on him, for he cares. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Amen. Right. See, what, I, what you're going through, the idea there is, is that when you cast it, that you throw it on the you throw it on the Lord. <laughs> I'm going through it. I can't, I can't handle the burden anymore. I can't carry the weight anymore. Lord, I can't get rid of this thing anymore. Nothing that anybody's trying to do is fixing the situation. I cast it at you, oh Lord God. I throw the idea is that you throw it. On the Lord. And the Bible says, and He cares for you. He's happy to take it. Yes, hallelujah. Cast your cares on Him, for He careth for you. He's happy to take the burden. Hallelujah. It's a spiritual truth, amen? Amazing. The idea is like, you can't carry it anymore, you cast it on Him, amen? A heavy load, a heavy burden, but He takes it off. That was point number two. No one else. Nothing else is going to fix it. Point number three is this. The Lord can make it better than you expect. Oh, Amen. Amen. The Lord can make it better than you expected. In verse 15 of chapter 5 it says, Sitting and clothed in his right mind. 
The, the idea behind right mind right there is that he was in control of himself. He, he had self-control. It wasn't just that he, was, he wasn't running around anymore, hooping and hollering, but he was able to function. And like, like the people around him marveled at how well he was handling himself. I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life where I wasn't able to control my behavior. <clears throat> Maybe you can't relate to that, but there's been times <laughs> in my life that I could not control my behavior. See, sin was more powerful than my will. And it drove me in a certain direction, and I could not say no. But I got, but this man was free, amen? And in Romans chapter 8, verse 2, I want to explain something to you real quick. This is what the scripture says. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I want to explain something to you. That, there, that, that what this passage of scripture in Romans 8, 2 is describing is the two most powerful spiritual laws on the face of the earth. The law of sin and death came into existence through the fall of Adam. The power of sin that rages in people's lives is more powerful than their will. But I'm here to tell you, because you can try all you want to, and you might do good for a while, and you might even have good intentions as a Christian, but I'm going to tell you right now, and if this, jack, if this messes up your theology, I'm sorry, but I'm not really sorry. Your willpower is not stronger than the, than the power of sin. That's right. But I can tell you about a power that is strong. Hallelujah. It's called the power of Calvary. Amen. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. See, you might not even hear the word cross right there, but let me get, explain some theology to you. I mean, I'm not trying to act like I'm teaching you something that you don't already know, but I'm just trying to explain something. The law of the spirit of life. What, what does that mean to you? What, what spirit do you think that they're talk, that he, Paul's talking about? Right there? He's talking about the Holy Spirit, right? The spirit of life. Jesus said that the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. What I need you to understand this morning is that it's the Holy Spirit that gives the life of God to fallen man upon this earth. But what that scripture says right there, that prepositional phrase, in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ the Holy Spirit works in the life of man based upon what Jesus has already done at the cross. What are you talking about, preacher? You and I, born of Adam, were born in sin. You and I, born of Adam and born in sin, are unworthy. And because of our unworthiness and our sinfulness, we cannot access the presence of God. But because Jesus came to earth in his perfect form and took upon himself our sin when he died on the cross, a great exchange took place. He took your guilt and he gave us as a gift his righteousness, Romans 5 17. That was the gift that God gave to man, the righteousness of Jesus given to you and now being justified by faith, now being made righteous by faith, you have peace with God and you have access into this grace in which you stand, Romans 5, 1 through 3. What I'm trying to tell you is this, is that through the great exchange, your faith in Christ and his right Righteousness. You now have been forgiven. You've been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. Now engaged is the, is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Where the Holy Spirit shows up and starts to do the work on your behalf. Let me tell you something. Devils tremble at the name of Jesus when the Holy Spirit shows up. Victory is already secure because Jesus paid the price. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. There might have been a time in your life when you couldn't have done it, but I'm here to tell you that Jesus has already come to do it for you. The victory is secure. Jesus has already won the battle, hallelujah, and he can make it better than what you That's expect. Right. I just imagine this man, and not only could he not find victory, but at the same time, the burden and the condemnation and the guilt because of the repeated failure that had gone on in his life, how he must have felt. Have you ever felt that way? Where well, you just keep on trying and you keep on getting up. You know, the Bible says a righteous man gets up. He might fall, but he gets up seven times. Amen. Amen. We're getting up people. 
But, but, but you know how the enemy works and he'll try to make you feel so guilty and full of condemnation. But guess what? There's another scripture right after that. That one I just read to you. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Hallelujah. I don't want to get into all the technical details of this passage, but let me just tell you this. There's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The Lord can do a work in your life where he literally lifts the burden of guilt and pain off of you. And he begins to allow you to walk in freedom and liberty. But I do, and people argue about the, that second part of the passage. I don't want to hear, I'm not here to argue about whether it was in the text or not. Because I'm here to tell you this is a spiritual truth. If you walk after the flesh... You will feel condemnation and guilt. Amen. If you follow after the leading of your flesh instead of the leading of the spirit, I can assure you the enemy will place condemnation and guilt on your back and you will not feel the freedom that you're desiring to feel that Jesus has already paid the price to give you because you're following after the flesh instead of following after the spirit. The spirit of God would say trust in Christ and what he's done. He can do better. Than what you expected. Amen. Last Amen. last point right here. Yes. Point number four. Good tidings. Mark chapter 5 verse 19. Jesus said go home to your friends and tell. Go home to your friends and tell. The word tell means to publish or herald the good news. When Jesus changes a person's life and sets them free from the bondage that had them trapped. Hallelujah. When he calms the storms in their life, the joy of the Lord gives them a desire to tell other people. Hallelujah. Now, let me tell you something. On that day, riding on that bike, when I tried to mention Jesus to that old boy, and he made that comment, and I shut my mouth, ain't nobody can shut my mouth after the Lord set me free. That's after right. the Lord set me free, oh, oh Lord, let me follow you. Come on, son. To go back and tell your friends. To go back and publish in the Decapolis. That was a 10 city area. Go back and publish the truth. Go back and tell them what I've done for you. Hallelujah. When God changes the inside of a person, you can't shut them up. That's right. Sometimes we're just going through the motions of Christianity. Sometimes people are sitting back thinking. Some people might even think, man, why Troy don't shut his mouth? Why, why Troy keeps on talking like that? Why Troy wants to talk about Jesus out in public? Why, why Robert wants to lay hands on people out in public? Why, so, why, why do all these people always, all they ever want to do is talk about Jesus? Because whenever the Lord sets you free, you want to publish it. Hallelujah. And you want to tell somebody the good news about Jesus. Amen. See, and you know what? This offers hope to another person. Yes. Amen. It offers hope to the next person that is settled in an unclean place. And has experienced the sad truth that no matter what they try, nothing else is working. I just want to tell you, don't quit. Don't you give up. You need to bow. You need to Jesus. Somebody would say, oh, well, I already tried that. I remember one time, I don't know if you remember this or not. I've told the story before. One time Aaron and I went to Bourbon Street with Lance Rao. Y'all pray for Lance. He's real sick. He's got cancer in his body. But he used to carry a cross all over the country. And I remember, boy, the Lord had just got a hold of me. And Aaron had already been friends with Lance. And would go witnessing with him and stuff like that. And Lance invited Aaron and I to go to Bourbon Street. And he was going to carry that cross out there in Bourbon Street. Did you talk about a trip? I don't have time to talk about all that right now. But anyway, we were out there. And I can remember, you might not remember this, but I remember it like it was yesterday. Aaron was witnessing to this guy. He's like, no, man, you, you, need, to, you need to give your heart. You need, to give, you need to let Jesus work in your life. And the dude said, oh, man, I already tried that. And Aaron said, excuse me? No, sir. Jesus isn't like a pair of shoes that you just take off your feet and you throw back in the closet. Jesus is something that you got to bow your life to. You got to give your life to. And I was like, man, that was so good. I think I might have even used it that night. But the point is, is this. A lot of times people are like, I already tried that. No, you ain't tried Jesus. Nope. Oh, you might have tried it like it was some little quick fix pill, but you didn't bow your knee to him. You didn't give your life to him. No, you still wanted to do it your way. No, if you bow your life to him and you surrender your life to him and you quit going Victory. through the motions Hallelujah. and you quit playing the games and you get you say, okay, Lord, I'm to the end of myself. No one else, nothing else is going to fix me. I need you and I surrender to you. Jesus is going to show That's up right. and he's going to do the work in your life. Yeah. Hallelujah that you... That you need him to do. Good news. Wow. This man has to say something. He was bound by the power of sin, but Jesus set him free. And that, my friends, is the Christmas message. Yeah. 
I was bound by sin, but Jesus set me free. Look at Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read the Christmas story to you. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 20. Just bear with me as we go through. It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house of he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought for, forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. You know, just to stop real quick and to say this, I, I know we've said this before, but it's amazing to me that the first people that God revealed the birth of the Savior of the world to was to lowly shepherds. Six miles away in Jerusalem, you got all the religious aristocracy, all dressed up in all this pretty religious clothing, going through all their traditions and all of this stuff. God just bypasses all that religious garbage and he shows up in this field where these shepherds are. And look what happens. It says right here, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Jesus came to die on the cross for and Don't let the world lie to you. <clears throat> don't let the world lie to you. Oh, well, you Christians can have your Jesus, but let the Buddhists have their Buddha and let the Muslims have their Allah and their prophet Muhammad. Let me tell you something. The Bible says that there's only one God and there's only one name Amen. under heaven by which man might be saved and we might be considered politically incorrect by the world today, but I'm here to tell you, don't let the world lie to you. There's only one way to get to heaven because there's only one that died on the cross. There's only one that had no sin. His name was Jesus and he died on the cross and he paid the penalty for sin. There's no other way to access the, the, the portals of heaven. You have to go through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's, that's all I'm saying about that. He says, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. This is what I want you to do. Listen to their message. Listen to the song that they sang. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace. Goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. The message was peace on earth, goodwill towards men. I felt like what the Lord really wanted to say this morning is that Christmas is so much more than just a sweet little baby, all wrapped up, born in a manger. But that in reality, it, this baby represents that Jesus was born to bring peace to this world. Jesus was bring, born to bring peace to the storms, to, to the fact that this whole earth is corrupted. One day he will return as the Prince of Peace and all of that chaos is going to be resolved. But not only that, Jesus was born to bring peace and goodwill towards men.